Hi, welcome to Keith Explains. It's another Wednesday. That means Keith Explains Day. So, topic one. I'm reading the newspaper. Apparently, someone has decided to truck guinea pigs across the country. Now, we had a guinea pig. We had two guinea pigs as a, as a present once, as, as little pets. A little cage for them. And we'd feed the guinea pigs, and we'd, we'd give them water, and they'd, they'd make noise, because that's what guinea pigs do. They kind of, they, they squeak and whistle. And then you can take them out and you can pet them. The guinea pigs don't really seem to love you, though. I mean, guinea pigs are just kind of pet. You can pet a guinea pig, and it probably makes a guinea pig happy. And you don't know. I mean, the guinea pig whistles, but other than that, you know, it's, guinea pig doesn't rub up against your leg and tell you it loves you. Guinea pig doesn't, you know, come trotting home with $20 bills clutched between its teeth, which, which is what we have trained our cats to do. See, we, we train the cats. It takes about nine months to train a cat to do this, but... It goes out at night. It's better if you get a black cat for this. Cat goes out at night, steals hubcaps. Then it takes the hubcaps, holds them between its little teeth, trots them down to the hubcap store. And once it gets to the hubcap store, it sells the hubcaps. Then it comes trotting home in the morning with little $20 bills clutched between its little teeth. It's cool because no one expects cats to do this. I mean, you know, you, you could have police out in a squad, you know, the hubcap theft finding squad. I'm sure there's one somewhere. You know, because our cat's been stealing hubcaps for years. I mean, someone's got to wonder where all the hubcaps go. But no one would no one would suspect a cat. I mean, it's the problem is cats aren't good with little tire irons, so they they have trouble getting the hubcaps off. But and those little locking nuts really annoy the cats, so they grind them with little teeth. But sometimes they can't get them off. Any, I'm getting off topic. So so apparently, like three or four months ago, some guy down in Hollister or one of them city south of us so you can actually afford things in still for like another week and a half had like 400 guinea pigs in his house and he was raising them to sell now 400 guinea pigs i mean once you flood the market with guinea pigs if you had 400 guinea pigs you were raising to sell i mean wouldn't it be better to sell like a small number of guinea pigs and a small number of hamsters you know keep the market high don't oversaturate or whatever but th this guy apparently had 400 i mean maybe maybe he had a breeding problem or something but so they, they went and they found them, and they went, well, these, these guinea pigs are living in horrible squalor, so we, we should rescue them. And so they took them off the Humane Society. Now, the problem is no one wants 400 guinea pigs. I mean, no individual person does, because if you had them, the Humane Society would come in and take them away from you. So, so they had to find individual people for each guinea pig, and they couldn't do it, because there aren't 400 people around here that want guinea pigs right now. Although, I bet if you put a big story on the front page of the newspaper, maybe you could find 400 people that wanted, you know, guinea pigs. But they can't do that, because they put a big story on the front page of the newspaper that said, we're taking 100 guinea pigs, and we're driving them from here to Indianapolis in a big Winnebago, and we're going to write about it for like five days. And then, so I start thinking, you know, doing the math, it's, it's like 2,000 miles to Indiana. And they're taking like a hundred guinea pigs. So you can start to do all kinds of cool things, like how many miles per guinea pig is it? You know, and then you do you do divide, and you go, man, that's like 20 miles per guinea pig. And then you figure they got to drive the Winnebago back, so it's even more. And then, you know, what, what kind of mileage does a Winnebago get? I mean, I think they get like six, seven miles to the gallon if you're lucky. They probably don't even take gas. They probably take that weird diesel stuff. So, you know, it's, it's like two gallons of gas per guinea pig. And I'm thinking, I mean, a gallon of gas weighs... I don't know, let's make a number up. A gallon of gas weighs like six, seven pounds. Maybe eight pounds. I mean, that's, that's like 16 pounds per guinea pig. I mean, couldn't we have just found people nearby for the guinea pigs and not wasted all either? This is why we have a fuel crisis. It's because people are trucking guinea pigs back and forth across the country. I mean, we, we should set up some kind of... Oh, we should set up some kind of stings. I mean, you know, when you get to the border of California, they say, do you have any fruit? And I don't know why they ask you if you have any fruit. I mean, maybe they figured it's not economical to, to truck fruit long distances. But clearly they never thought anyone would truck guinea pigs long distances. You know, just a huge Winnebago full of squeaking, squealing little guinea pigs. Just smelling like guinea pigs do, driving them across country. I mean, you could make a movie like Deliverance about this. You know, with a banjo player. It's kind of weird. And then... And then they got a reporter in a car driving behind the Winnebago every day writing about what happened on the guinea pig underground railroad. I didn't really know guinea pigs were, you know, in a situation where they needed an underground railroad. And even if they did, I mean, 
So we're shipping guinea pigs. I mean, couldn't we just FedEx the guinea pigs to Indianapolis? I mean, it's, it's like 10 bucks a box. I mean, <laughs> I think we're paying more in gas than that. You know, you, get, you go down to the FedEx office, they got those nice little fold-up boxes. Um, you wouldn't want to use the thin one because guinea pigs are kind of tall, but, you know, kind of a little box-shaped one. Put the guinea pig in the box, put some newspaper in there for when the guinea pig does what guinea pigs do. A um, little dish of water wouldn't work because it'd probably tip over. But you could put like lettuce in there, you know, something for the guinea pig to eat. Punch some holes in the box. Always punch holes in the box. When I've FedExed guinea pigs in the past, if I forgot to punch the holes in the box, it, it wasn't a pretty sight. So you punch some holes in the box and you take it down to FedEx. I mean, you'd have a hundred of them. And they might notice a hundred boxes that all squeaked. So you maybe want to spread it out over a week or two. You can just FedEx them and then they're there the next day. I mean, right now people in Indiana got to wait like a week and a half for guinea pigs. I mean, their guinea pigs will be car sick by the time they get them. And plus, I think no guinea pig should have traveled further this year than you did. You know, I mean, it's like the guinea pigs getting a vacation and you aren't. I mean, what kind of justice is that in the world? So why do people do this? You got to ask yourself. So now last week I'm reading the news and I have a little cell phone and I will, with my little cell phone, I went to the, the state of California webpage and they said email alerts. And I thought, cool, something else to clog my mailbox. So I signed up for everything, not everything, signed up for all the Bay Area ones, all the statewide ones, all the, the world's about to end ones, everything. So I like get all this email, it says EDIS, uh, emergency something. And like a week ago, and, and I used to get, I'd get like one email every other day, because apparently California has, it's like half an emergency a day on the average. You know, something weird had happened. They'd, they'd email you like when an earthquake happened. That'd be cool because then I could, you know, imagine it casually in conversation. Like, hey, did you feel that earthquake 10 minutes ago? People would go like, no. you go like, well, yeah, it was a 1.6 down in Los Angeles. Yeah, it kind of made me rock a little bit in my chair. And I, see, but I, I'd have gotten it because it came over my little cell phone thingy. And then suddenly, like a week ago, like, I got 19 emails by the time I woke up in the morning. And, and, and the way they come through, I only get 150 characters of them, so it, it kind of sucks, because if there's an actual emergency, I'm not going to get enough text to tell me what the emergency is. Really, the email tells me i got to go look at my real email to see what the emergency is. And, and if the emergency is really bad, like I won't be able to get to my email, which, which would be an emergency. I mean, you could send out an emergency alert about that. Keith's not able to read email. How will he live? But... So when I get there, I read it, and I, it's, it's the Amber Alert system. And there, there, are, there are two teenage girls, and they're missing. Someone stole them in a white Bronco. And why is it always white Broncos, okay? Whoever makes Broncos should just stop painting them white because they're causing crime. I don't know how. I don't know why. But it's just sometimes you just got to look at the facts and go, white Broncos somehow cause bad things to happen. Maybe the universe doesn't like white Broncos, whatever. Stop making white Broncos, whoever the Bronco makers are. But that's getting a little aside. So someone like stole two girls and was in a white Bronco, and they wanted the entire state to know it so we could look for the white Broncos. And personally, I, I never trust a white Bronco. If I'm on the road and there's a white Bronco near me, I know something somewhere has gone bad, and I'm just nearby it. So I always give them a lot of room. Um, so they... They sent out this Amber Alert, and then, I mean, thankfully, like, like 14 hours later, they found them, you know, because the whole state got alerted, white Bronco, white Bronco, you got to look for the white Bronco, ever, and then someone found a white Bronco. So in a sense, the Amber Alert worked. But then I thought, well, well, why did it work? And a lot of people think it's, well, because we, you know, we, we put the little alerts up on all the freeway signs, and everyone read them and was looking for the white Broncos. Only if you actually look at it, the person that actually spotted the white Bronco didn't read the freeway sign. You know, she was like a park ranger, and she'd heard it over her police radio. So the police, you know, they could just send these out over the police radios, and the same effect would have been there. And I realized, well, the reason they put them up on the freeway signs is that pretty much ensures that every freeway is just, you know, totally jammed up because everyone slows down to read what's blinking on the sign. So the purpose of putting the Amber Alerts up on the freeway signs is, in fact, to cause congestion. And it slows everything down, and then the police can just fly over the entire state and look at everyone's license plate at the same time because everyone's just stuck on a freeway. Because you can't go anywhere because everyone's reading and then suspecting people in the car next to them. Like, 
That doesn't really look like a Bronco. It looks like a BMW, but maybe they misspelled BMW. So maybe I'd better get on my cell phone and call in that, that kind of dark metallic gray BMW next to me as the white Bronco, because two of the letters in the license plate are the same. So that's, uh, again, just why do it? Now, the stock market. Again, as you know, I talk about the stock market because I unerringly know what it's going to do. Now, I never act on this knowledge. In fact, I often act exactly against this knowledge. Like, I'll wake up, like, I'll go to bed one morning and go, or go to bed one night. Sometimes I go to bed in the morning, you know, if I stay up really late. But you know, I'll go, man, the stock market's been going down for days. I bet it goes up tomorrow. But I, I don't do anything. Or like, I'll go, yeah, the stock market was up today. I bet it's going to fall tomorrow. And it always does, but I never do anything. So I don't know. That's, that, to me, is one of them cause and effect Heisenberg things. Like, if I actually did anything, then I'd force it to not do what I thought it was going to do. But that aside, so I watch me the stock market show, CNBC or MSNBC, it's one of those. Channel 61 on my cable system. They always have stock market. Every day it's stock market. I used to turn it on every morning, and then I stopped turning it on because it made me unhappy. Because I realized every morning, you're losing money, Keith. And then, then suddenly I was losing huge amounts of money. And then everyone stopped watching it, apparently. Like the, the viewership in this channel dropped by like two thirds since everyone realized the stock market's just making us unhappy now. We're not going to watch the stock market program anymore. But so sometimes I turn it on, and they're always still talking about the stock market. I mean, even though no one's watching, because no one cares, because it just makes us all unhappy now. They still talk about how it's either going up or it's going down. And lately it goes down. It goes down a lot. Down, 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 down. And then they'll have an up day, and then everyone that night will be going, is the downslide over? Is this the beginning? No, it's never the beginning, OK? Stock market's going down from here on out. It is never going up again. Pretty much it's going to go negative. I mean, pretty much if you own stocks, people are going to come knock on your door every morning and go, Mr. Statenfield, you owe us $7 today. You go, why? I'll go, well, remember you bought that, that Terra Global? Yeah, they need more money. They're out of money. they got no more money left. They're going out to all their shareholders asking everyone for $7. You go, I don't want to give them $7. And they go, no, they passed a law. Now you have to give them $7. Because that's, that's how it would work for me. I mean, I, I always thought, you know, because I'd seen this on a stock market show, if you buy stock, you can't lose more money than you paid for the stock. You know, you buy 500 bucks worth of, st share of stock, most it can do is fall to zero, and then you're out $500, right? And then, then I had a stock I bought, paid $500 for it, and it in fact fell to zero. Well, it doesn't fall to zero, it falls to 0.001. But then you try and sell it at that, and people laugh at you. Because they're like, no, that, that's the special number we use to mean it's actually at zero. But we don't want to call it zero, because that would make you realize you were a moron when you thought, well, th surely this company will, will totally corner the American anime market. No, no, not at all. OK, so anyway, so I got 500 bucks worth of stock. Now I'm thinking, well, now for my tax guy, apparently, I have to find some other sucker who's willing to pay zero for this stock so I can claim to sell it, so I can you know, deduct it off my, my vast winnings in the stock market. I don't have any winnings. I don't know how you deduct against no winnings. But, but I, the tax guy will figure out something. But, so now I've got to find some guy that will pay for my you know, 200 shares worth of zero stock, and I've got to pay my stockbroker 30 bucks to sell it to this guy. And I sell it to him at 0.001. So somewhere there's a guy that buys stock at, you know, tenth of a penny per share or something. And I'm thinking, well, what does he do with the stock? And then I realized he's probably a wallpaper guy. He probably just buys the stock and asks for the certificates and then wallpapers people's rooms. Because I think that'd be cool right now. Like, if you used to work at Enron, your bathroom should be Enron shares. Just everywhere. My, my parents had a bathroom. It was... American flags. Well, it was red, white, and blue stripes. It was the weirdest bathroom because it was red, white, and blue stripes the whole way. You never knew how high you were in the bathroom because the, the, you always felt like you were plummeting. But that aside, see Enron shares. You could paper your walls with Enron shares. If, if someone in the audience takes this idea and runs with it and makes a million dollars selling the Enron shares as wallpaper, please send me some cash because, again, I got nothing now. You know, I bought me the biotax. I bought me the... Don't I, See, but, so I watch the shows and they're like, well, 
Now's the turnaround. Buy, buy, buy. No, I have no money left. Oh, but I've been assured that this is it. From now on, the stock market's only going up again. This whole down thing was just an aberration. It was a mistake. Someone punched the wrong little key, and it's back up again. OK, I also haven't watched me the Fox News. Apparently, we're going to invade Iraq, because I don't know why. They never mention that part. They always say, we're going to invade Iraq. And then they kind of go, well, you know, Iraq was behind that 9-11 thing. And I think, well, I thought that was Al-Qaeda. Well, I don't actually know how you pronounce Al-Qaeda. Maybe Al-Qaeda is actually pronounced Iraq. <laughs> I mean, they've, they both got Q's in them. And it, who knows? Maybe it was just a mistake. Maybe it was Iraq the whole time. I mean, there's, there's Saddam Hussein in Iraq, and there's Osama bin Laden. And Osama bin Laden has a beard. Saddam Hussein has no beard. Maybe they're the same guy. Maybe Saddam Hussein just grew a beard and then acted like Osama bin Laden over in whatever Stan, and then, you know, shaved, snuck back into Iraq so that he could be fearsome leader there. I mean, so they talk about invading Iraq. And it's like, well, you know, we have different plans for invading Iraq. And then I keep thinking, shouldn't, doesn't Congress have to declare war before we're allowed to invade somewhere? I mean, I, I didn't pay a lot of attention in history class because, well, because I had a bad history teacher. A really bad history teacher. She, she couldn't remember numbers at all. So she'd say when something was, and half the class would correct her. And she'd be off like 100 years. Like, you know, the pilgrims landed in 1492. And we're like, no. It was later. I don't know when, 1670, around then, I hope. I mean, otherwise, I've just looked like a total moron on TV. Oh, wait. I've got a TV show. I do that every week. Oh, sorry. So, so we're invading Iraq, and I don't know why. Maybe they'll tell me someday. But you know, we've got plans for invading Iraq, and they talk about when we're going to do it. And I think, well, do we need to invade Iraq? And then I remember, oh, yeah, President Bush's numbers are going down. Of course we have to invade Iraq. We've got to invade someone. Here's a diff totally different story, changing the topic. So, so a couple weeks ago, I took my car over to the, to the, the Goodyear to get, the, to get it fixed. And then Goodyear closes at 7. It's like 6 o'clock. I haven't heard my car's done. So I call the Goodyear. I'm like, is my car done? They're like, well, yeah, it's done. I'm like, you know, OK. They're like, but it's really hot, and we all want to leave. I'm like, OK, why are you telling me this? I mean, I, I didn't know I was the reason you were staying. And they're like, well, you're about the last car that hasn't been picked up yet. So I'm like, fine, OK, just put the key in the car. Don't lock it. And I'll walk over there, and you guys can leave. I'll give you my credit card. You can charge it. So about 7.15, I leave work. You can see how diligent I am. I'm still at work at 7.15, working, or surfing the internet, one of those two. But I walk over to Goodyear, and I get there, and they have, in fact, fixed my car. Looks lovely. They have charged my credit card. Great. They have put my key in the car. Fabulous. They have locked my car. Bad. Because they have my car key. So now, I'm standing outside my car. No car key. So what do I do? I could do one of two things. I could scream. I suppose I could do more than two things. I could scream. I screamed briefly. I went, ah! But that didn't get me anywhere. So then I thought, well, fine. It's a nice day. I'll just walk home. I live you know, maybe half an hour from work. Walk will do me good. I mean, anyone seen me standing knows walk will do me a little bit of good. Not a lot of good. OK, a lot of good. I should walk more. I should walk every day. I don't. But anyway, this day, I was going to walk. So, so I start walking home. I'm like halfway home, and I'm walking down the street. And this little cat races across the street over to bump its little head up against me, because cats love me. I don't know why. Cats love me, or at least this cat did. Most cats hate me. This cat, so I look down at it, I think, man, this is a cute, what's wrong with this cat? Okay. This cat had like the most matted fur I'd ever seen in a cat, okay? It had like three inch little fur things hanging off the cat, just kind of had torn away. This cat looked pitiful. Friendly, but pitiful. So, so I think, what can I do about this cat? And I thought, well, I'll carry the cat home and I'll give the cat a bath. And I've given our other cats a bath sometimes. They hate it. They make noise and they really don't like it. But, you know, you can give a cat a bath. 
So I, I pick the cat up, and I'm walking down the street with it, and I get like a block away, and the cat decides, I don't want to have nothing to do with this guy no more. And he leaves. End of story, right? I mean, it's cat, really mad at fur, Keith tried to take it home and clean it, nothing happened. Ah, see this? This is the difference between uh, an ordinary storyteller and a master storyteller. See, I've waited for act two. See, before I only had an act one. Now, act two. So like a couple weeks later, I'm driving home, same route, about the same time of day, I see the cat. And I go, this is cool, because now I'm in a car. So I, I get out of my car, and the cat races over and bumps his little head up against me, and it's still matted all over, and it looks bad, and I'm like, uh-huh, I have a car. So I pick the cat up, and I put the cat in my car, and the cat is curious, because cats are curious before they realize they're locked in a car. <laughs> and the cat kind of looks around a little, and then I close the door, and I start driving home, and then the cat goes, wait, I used to live there. And then what does the cat think happened? And then I realized, the cat thinks it's being catnapped. And it is. So I get it home to my house. Now I got a cat covered with stuff. And I'm thinking, well, fine, I'll just wash the cat. All the other people in my house went, you can't wash that cat. That cat will kill you. You should take that cat over to the vet. Get the cat, get the vet to give the cat a bath. Because apparently they have special anti-cat killing things at the vet that keeps, I don't know what they do. I've, I've never seen what they have there. But I assume they have them because they're a vet and they'd have technology. So, so I get there and now I call the vet up and I go, well, I have a cat. I want to get it bathed. And they're like, uh, when can you bring it in? And I'm like, well, I'm assuming not now because it's three minutes to eight. And I'm pretty sure you closed. And they're like, yes, we're closed. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll bring it over tomorrow. And they're like, well, we, we can't bathe the cat. It hasn't had its shots. Like, well, that seems like a weird rule, but okay. And then I realize it's probably because the, the special not being killed by the cat machine you know, involves a person that doesn't want to be killed by a cat that hasn't had a shot. So I put the cat in the garage, give the cat some food. Cat loves food. Still pitiful, still friendly. Put the cat in the garage, go to bed, wake up the next morning, get out the cat box, put the box down, go out and get the cat. Cat's still friendly. Put the cat in the box. Now the cat's not happy. Put the cat box in my car drive it six blocks down to the vet, take it into the vet and say, hi, here's the cat. And they go, what's the cat's name? I have no idea what the cat's name is. The cat's name is, it's that cat that needs a bath. So then I think, well, we'll, we'll call the cat Tiki. Because I call all cats Tiki. Because apparently there was some book that I read when I was like three where they called the cat Tiki. So all cats are Tiki. But so I write that down. And now they think this is really the cat's name. Like they assume the cat will answer to the name Tiki. Which, the cat's never heard the word Tiki before in its life, probably. I mean, I didn't call it Tiki the night before or nothing. So, so I put the cat down, and they're like, wow, that's a bad cat. And then i got to explain that this isn't my cat, okay? I'm, I'm doing this as a favor to, well, to Tiki now. And they're like, okay, we, has the cat had its shots? And I have no, I have no idea. And they're like, okay, we'll give him a shots. And it's, it's going to be like 70 bucks to bathe the cat, which is a lot of money. I mean... You know, for a cat that, that's on the street. But So I figure, what the heck, we'll bathe the cat, and then the cat will be happy. I mean, it won't be happy while it's bathing. And it probably won't be happy for a while after it's been bathed. But, but cats don't have great memories. I mean, I know this because we have cats at home, and we'll, you know, put the flea stuff on the cat, and then the cat's not happy at us. And then, like a day later... Cat's rubbing up against us. The cat is happy at us again, which means the cat has forgotten the horrible thing we did to it the day before. Which it'd be kind of cool if people could be that way. Like you could do something horrible to a person, they'd forget about the next day, and it sort of works, but not as well. Because with cats, they just forget everything. But so this cat, leave it there, and I go to work, and then they call me about 10:30, and they say, "Well, gave your cat the shots," and I'm like, "Well, it's not my cat. It's just a stray." And they're like, "Why'd you bring it in?" And I'm like, "Well, have you looked at it?" And they're like. Well, yeah, it has really matted fur. Um, that's what we're calling you about. Um, the cat hates us. I'm like, well, of course the cat hates you. You're going to try and bathe it. I mean, they're like, no, the cat really hates us. It won't let us near us. It's hissing. It's biting. We, we don't know if we can bathe it. And then here's, see, here's the moment of disappointment for me because I've realized there's no magic cat bathing machine. There's just a person there 
that has to hold a cat in a sink and bathe it. And this cat ain't having nothing to do with that. So, so they're like, well, we could do a couple things. We could sedate the cat. I'm like, okay, like a little kitty valium. They're like, but state law says we have to give it a physical first. And that'd be like 60 bucks. Now, now this is just starting to add up. I'm thinking, this is more than I pay for my cats. You know, 60 bucks to bathe the cat, and then like sedatives are like 25 bucks for a cat. They're like, or we could just kind of try to do what we could do. We could maybe cut most of the mats away, and he'd probably let us do that. And I'm like, okay, why don't you do that? We'll see how it works. And I'm like, okay. And then I hear nothing more of them all day, which I had these fantasies kind of mid-afternoon that the cat had leveled the entire veterinary establishment, you know, kind of like in that Terminator movie where you just kill everyone in the police station, and then you leave. But then, you know, I called them back and was my cat done? And they went, what's your cat's name? And I went, Dickie. And they went, well, that's a cute name for a cat. And I went, well, the cat doesn't know that's its name. And then I had to explain the stray story again. They're like, well, oh, ah, that cat. <laughs> when, when you call your vet and they go, oh, that cat, you have a problem. So I, so I drive over there. Now they, as expected, were not able to bathe the cat. So instead they, they shaved the cat. They mostly shaved the cat. They couldn't shave its head. I mean, why would you? Because it wasn't really matted. But, but beyond that, the head is the part nearest the mouth, which I think is the problem on this cat. But they shaved most of the body and then they didn't shave the tail, because apparently the tail was capable of achieving supersonic speed or something, and, and took out a couple of people. So the tail is not shaved. Most of the body shaved, except a little feet still had hair on them. And then the head, full hair. Okay, this, this is the saddest looking cat ever. Well, when you see him from far away. When you see him from close up and he sees you, suddenly he's an angry cat. Okay, so now it's late in the day. And I'm thinking, well, I ought to take the cat back home. But then I thought, well, I'll, I'll take it home, let it relax a bit. What was I thinking? And then I'll take it back to where I got it from. And then it'll just, it'll be a shaved cat where it is. And that'll be better than it was with all the mats. But, so I get it back home. I take it out of the box in the garage, give it, you know, put down a little food for it to eat, put down some water for it to drink. The cat eats the food, drinks the water, and then goes and hides won't have nothing to do with me because I'm the guy that put it in the box that took it to the place where they shaved the cat. I am not to be trusted, especially if I have a cat box near me, which I do because I want to take the... So I chased the cat around my garage for like 45 minutes to try to catch it to put it back in the box. I couldn't catch it. So I'd go back in and I'd watch TV for a while on my TiVo and I'd come, you know, relax from chasing the cat. You just zoom back and forth and then I go out and try and catch again. Eventually I realized, wait, this cat loves food. So I put some food in the bowl, put the food in the cat box, and the cat went, well that's a cat box, but that's food! Went straight for the food, closed the cat box, put the cat in my car, took it back to where I got it from, opened the box, cat stepped out, it hates me. I know it hates me because of the way it looked at me. You know, one of them, them looks of disgust and revulsion. Oh, and it hated me. And then and it ran away. And I haven't seen it since. <laughs> Come back next week. We'll have another show. I don't know what we'll talk about. Maybe I'll talk about some of the stuff I missed. Otherwise, have a lovely evening. Get some rest.